Stories of slavery and fiction usually end with freedom as a goal. In Essie Adujian's latest book, the Giller Prize winning novel, Washington Black, freedom is just the beginning. It's a breathtaking book that captures the sweep of history and the complexity of the essential question, what does it mean to really be free? And we're pleased to welcome Essie Adujian to our studio for more. Hi. Hi. So nice to have you here. I'm pleased to be here. I know you're not feeling well, but we really <laughs> appreciate you making the time for us to talk about this great book. Well, thank you. Um, so um, uh, reading this book, or even the books that I've read in the past about uh, slavery, uh, they don't usually turn into an adventure story. But to me, Washington Black kind of felt like one. Why? Well, <laughs> I guess when I was writing the novel uh, at the outset, um, it had sort of come out of different material, like very kind of, um, you know, multi-storied, wild um, source material. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was probably in my mind. Uh, but I also think of it as being like a post-slavery narrative uh, in that it's really a book about, less about his time uh, in bondage and more about his uh, going out as, um, first as a runaway, uh, but eventually as a freed man into the world. And, uh, you know, what would that look like, him wanting to construct a life for himself? Um, you know, what forms can it take? Uh, where will he feel most at home? Uh, so those were the questions that were driving the story. Uh, and then there's, there's quite a bit of whimsy in that too. And also probably what it means to be free, right? Mm -hmm. That was my interpretation as well. Yeah, yeah, is that he's somebody who, not only what it means to be free, but uh, how can I get my foothold in the world? And, and where can I best live my life uh, as a man who, who was a slave and who's looking uh, for, for a better place? And so the novel moves through so many different landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's in the Arctic and it's in England and it's in Virginia, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Washington is really kind of searching uh, for his place in the world and discovering at every turn that he doesn't, he doesn't feel comfortable or that he feels like he's being rejected by a certain place. Uh, and, and so he's constantly moving. Uh, but what he's looking for is his, his freedom. And, but it's like he doesn't quite understand what form it should take. And so he's searching for something that's, uh, I mean, it's, it's an abstraction in a sense. It's 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 intangible, uh, and so he doesn't even really quite know what he's looking for. But he's he's moving and he's searching. And all the places that he goes, it feels like a sense of whimsy, like he's uh, going from place to place. Would it have worked if he had just stayed in one place? I think it would have been a very different story. Um, and in fact, an earlier draft did have him uh, leaving the plantation and then just staying in England. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it really felt like the book wanted to be something else. It wanted to be about him really not being able to find a place where he feels at home. Um, and so, and also the sense of adventure, or the sense of slightly, um, slightly larger than life uh, kind of thing, um, or tone to the book. I think it really speaks to um, how he would feel to just go out into the, the regular world as somebody who was, who was recently freed. Like, everything is heightened. There's a sense of, um, of uh, slight surrealness to, to every experience. Um, and by actually kind of forcing that tone a bit in the book, uh, the reader comes to feel this alongside him, that there's a real um, strangeness and, and wonder to life uh, and to being out in the world. And so I really wanted to engender that same sense of wonder in the reader uh, that, that he would feel just as a freeman going out into the world. Well, the book starts out on our Barbados plantation called Faith, um, where you know the treatment of slaves is so brutal that mm. many commit suicide as a means of escape. Uh, was committing suicide common during slavery? Yeah, so that fact came out of um, came out of my reading. Um, that I was reading uh, one book in particular, which was a woman exploring her family's history uh, in Barbados, because her one of her great 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 
forebears had gone and established a plantation in Barbados. Um, and there was a time where um, the slaves on that plantation had had some of them, you know, came from certain tribes in Western Africa who had the belief that you would be reincarnated in your homeland if you killed yourself. And so that was something that started to become a bit more common mm -hmm. uh, until, of course, it gets very brutally uh, shut down. And early in the book, uh, the main character, who's nicknamed Wash, uh, his full name is George Washington Black, mm. um, he's uh, taken from uh, field work to assist Titch, who's the brother of the plantation owner. Um, how did slaves, because I noticed a shift of how Washington was treated. Um, how did fields, how did uh, slaves in the field interact with slaves who worked in the houses of the plantation owners? Yeah, so it seemed to be a very, um, that there wasn't a lot of interaction between the house slaves and the field slaves. Um, you know, there was really a, a kind of demarcation between these two realities. So if you were a field slave, you were obviously, you were out in the sun, so you were, you were darker skinned. Um, you were, you know, just sort of physically even looked very different um, from somebody in the house who would be sort of a lighter skinned slave um, who, you know, would have been very, uh, I, I guess, working within the system of, um, of having to interact with more closely with um, the plantation uh, with the plantation owners and his family, uh, and you know the workings of, of the house. Um, I, I think that there wasn't sort of a, a ton of um, communication between the two. Was there a little bit like in the book? Because I sense there was a little bit of tension between the two. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think the house slaves would have had a sense of superiority. Um, you know, over the field slaves who they, you know, they would have seen themselves as being, um, I, I guess, a much more sort of refined sort of slave. Um, and then the, the, the slaves in the field, I guess, would have a bit of resentment to the slaves in the house. Yeah, and uh, in the novel, uh, Washington has the feeling of, um, you know, of Gaius as being a sort of proxy master, mm. just because he, you know, he sort of feels like he has the, the bearing of, of the master. Uh, and, and other people in the house, and so there really is a, a, a psychological, like a, just a tension between those two. Groups. And even I don't want to give out, away too much of the book, uh, but there's also um, there's this kind of emptiness when it comes to families. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, people are you know there's secrets about who's related to whom. I mm -hmm. guess because they're trying to keep their family safe. Uh, what was the impact of slavery on families or the ability to even feel as though you could have one? Uh, I think so many families were broken up. Um, you know, uh, people would be sold away from certain plantations. Uh, so that whole family unit was not, um, was not a stable one. Uh, and if a female slave uh, did manage to produce a child, um, because in Barbados, uh, especially, the conditions on the plantations were so poor and the field slaves were treated so severely and most of the slaves in the field were women, uh, we don't think about this, but a, a lot of female laborers, that it became difficult to, you know, carry a pregnancy to term. And so, um, you know, if you actually did manage to have a child, there was the feeling that this child would most certainly be be taken away, uh, and and so the family unit was just completely destroyed. And Wash has, you know, again, I'm trying not to give away too much of the book. Um, sure. He finally escapes slavery early on in the book, um, with I guess one idea of what freedom means. But what does freedom actually end up looking like for Washington? So Washington is very early in the book, he's taken um, into the care of a woman called Big Kit, who is what's called a saltwater, or what they would have called a saltwater, uh, which is a slave that, um, you know, was born in Africa and then transported uh, across the ocean, uh, as opposed to a slave who's born on a plantation, mm. which is what Washington is. And so she has some idea or some notion of what it meant to be free. 
And so when she, you know, when he says, what is freedom? And uh, she, she tells him what this is, he really holds this uh, dearly. And, and what she tells him freedom is, uh, you know, it's a very, very, very basic idea of what freedom can be, like very rudimentary, um, just, you know, things like um, freedom is the freedom not to work. Mm -hmm. And it's the freedom not to speak uh, if, if you don't, you know, not to answer a question if you don't like how the question was posed or what the question is. So to have autonomy over self. Uh, yeah. Um, but it's said in a very basic way. It's, it's not like to have autonomy over your body mm -hmm. and your thoughts. It's just, you know, it's, it's um, you know, if you don't want to drink that glass of water, don't drink it. And, and also freedom from human entanglements, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just don't have any sort of very close relationships and you'll be fine. Um, so th there's a lot that he takes away from what she's trying to impart that it's much too, uh, so, too basic. Mm -hmm. And so as he goes out into the world and he's trying to live by the tenets that she's kind of laid out for him, he recognizes that, you know, freedom is, is trickier than what she said. It's, um, it's much more uh, uh, expansive, uh, but it's also a much more limited thing. Uh, he realizes that as a black man uh, and as a disfigured man, uh, going out into the world, um, you know, there are limitations to the, the freedom that he can claim for himself. But this is the thing that I found really uh, interesting. Um, he's already somebody that stands out. He's mm. uh, a black man. Um, he's escaped bondage. And then you, the writer, <laughs> mm -hmm. decide to, like you said, this. I wasn't going to mention it unless you mentioned it. Sure. But then yeah. um, he gets a disfigurement. So he even stands out more. Yes. Why did you add that layer onto this person who's already caring so much? Yeah, it just seemed to come organically out of the text. Uh, this idea that he he's essentially disfigured by a scientific experiment. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that seemed very symbolic, that um, it would be uh, helping this man, you know, do his, his um, build his contraption, that this would be the thing that, that sort of marks him. And he was helping Titch, the man who helped him escape? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. And, um, helping him with this, you know, this is, this is what, what ultimately ends up causing this disfigurement. And so it gives him this extra... Um, I guess this extra layer of otherness mm -hmm. as he goes out into the world. Uh, and, you know, there's a scene later in the book where he's uh, sitting at a tavern uh, with a friend. And, um, you know, this is obviously black clientele in this tavern. But as he's sitting there, you know, these two men come up and they're really uh, harassing him over this disfigurement. And so there's the sense that he, you know, he can't be at ease uh, Ever. <laughs> Ever, right. Even at the place where, you know, he would feel that he would be most at ease, that this is, this is a place where he, he can't be at home. He can't ever feel, uh, you know, that he's part of the, the social fabric. Um, and as I mentioned, Titch, the plantation master's uh, brother, helps Washington escape faith after something happens. Mm -hmm. um, but is it fair to say that he saves him? Um, you know, I think that's a, that's a good question. I think it's something that, um, I think he does save him. I think he, he most definitely does save him. Um, you know, if he hadn't taken him away, Washington would certainly uh, have been killed. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting to me are the motivations for saving him. Uh, why does he take him? Uh, would he have taken him if, you know, if Washington uh, didn't prove to be such a quick study uh, with his drawing? And, and also with his aptitude for science. Mm -hmm. uh, so he has and, his own motives maybe beyond yeah. being altruistic. Yeah, and I think, I think he would probably only speak to the altruistic ones. I think mm -hmm. you know, he's not even really questioning his other, his other motives. Because he, well, <laughs> I was about to say something before. Anyway, it's really hard to do, you know, anyway. But you've said in other interviews that uh, an editor who looked at early uh, pages of the book worried that Titch, uh, Titch's role would make the book 
like a white savior story where a, a white person saves a black individual. Um, how important was it for you to question that trope? Oh, it was hugely important for me. And I think the editor looking at the book had only kind of seen maybe the first fifth or the first quarter of the book. And so, you know, if you were just to read that deeply and you wouldn't kind of start to see the ways in which um, Titch is uh, a complicated man. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I was, when I was doing research, I came across this story of, uh, uh, it was in an Eric Foner book. Um, and it was about an abolitionist meeting in New York and a, a Quaker meeting. Mm -hmm. So it was in the House of Friends. Uh, and they were sitting down to discuss uh, sort of what they could do to, to end slavery in America uh, and the plight of the black man. Uh, and what was interesting to me is that, you know, they were very intensely discussing this. But at that meeting were three, um, three African Americans, mm -hmm. uh, but they were made to sit sort of on pews, you know, away from everybody else, and they weren't at all consulted uh, for their opinions mm -hmm. uh, on any of this, and so... There was no collaboration. <laughs> it was, was like they were no talking about them while they were in the room. Yeah, exactly. And, and you start to wonder, like, what is the, what is the impulse of, of you wanting to, you know, to save, uh, you know, the black man? What is, you're not even really sort of inviting uh, these people into your, uh, into your discussion, and, and who better than they would would be able to, to talk about this. So I just thought the irony of that was really interesting to me. And I think uh, it's that kind of dichotomy that really informs Titch's character. Um, I want to pull up something you wrote for a lecture series in uh, 2014. And I was sure. wondering if you could okay. just read this for me, please. Home, for me, was not a birthright, but an invention. It seems to me that when we speak of home, we are speaking of several things, often at once, muddled together into an uneasy stew. We say home and mean origins. We say home and mean belonging. These are two different things, where we come from and where we are. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, you and Wash have something in common. You've both lived so many places. Um, mm -hmm. What role does the idea of home have in the stories that you write? I think it if I think of all of the books, it seems like that's the core idea sitting at the heart of all of them is somebody searching for the place in the, their place in the world and where they're going to feel most comfortable and most at home. Mm -hmm. uh, and then them recognizing that this, this sort of um, ideal place uh, doesn't actually exist. Uh, and that the, the feeling of, of being at home uh, it's so complicated that there are so many things that can make up our, our concept of home. And this is, I mean, it's, it sounds so, um, so kind of almost sort of flippant to put it this way, but you know, we can find our home in, in other people, um, in our, those relationships that we form with, with people around us um, and, and our, our connection to them. This is a huge part, I think, of, of how we begin to feel at home in a place, is, is um, the society uh, that we build for ourselves. Um, and so, you know, when Big Kit tells Washington <clears throat> that, uh, you know, freedom is freedom from human entanglements, this is probably the worst thing uh, that she could say to somebody like him who really needs, uh, what he's most lacking in life are these connections uh, because obviously families were so, um, so broken up, so destroyed uh, by slavery that, that these fundamental connections that we need to make with other human beings, these are, you know, this, is, this is part of the psychological warfare of, of slavery is, is breaking up these connections uh, that are so essential to our feeling of, of being at home. And so what he most needs is to, to establish that network. And he kind of does find that a little bit towards the end of the book with, I, with I thought Tana. That was such and, a, I thought that was such a heartbreaking thing, uh, heartbreaking thing to say, what Big Kid said, free from human entanglements, because that is, well, then what is life 
without those entanglements. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, we're running out of time, just, <laughs> so I just wanted to get uh, some more questions in. Um, the the narration in all of your books um, has such a distinctive voice, um, Half Black Blues versus Washington Black, mm -hmm. uh, for example. What did you do to get into the voice of these characters? Yeah, getting into the voice of these characters is something that um, can be a long process. So for Half Blood Blues, for instance, uh, the very first draft was just written in a very plain spoken, straightforward style. Um, you know, just could have been set kind of in any time period, just very, um, you know, not showy at all. And I gave it to um, my husband, who's my first reader, and he just said, this is, this is so boring and so <laughs> blah. <laughs> you know, why don't you try and play with, with voice, uh, which is one of the, the privileges, I think, of working with first person, is that you can really um, create these inflections and... and, and um, but really you must have done a lot of research, because, I mean, the slang, the lingo... Yeah. And they're two very distinctive voices uh, for the Half Blood Blues and Washington Black. Yeah, so Half Blood Blues was a lot of research into, um, you know, there's some New Orleans jazz slang, there's some Chicago jazz slang. Mm. Uh, but also filtering this through, for me, they're speaking a kind of, um, it's like half German, it's, you know, a little bit of jazz slang. So it was also trying to come up with terms that, that would sound as though they were filtered through German, uh, and, and also terms that would describe uh, the features of their landscape, uh, this new world that they're living in. So what would they call Nazis? And, and all of this, and, and so having to come up with terms for that. Uh, and so it was great fun, it's a lot of play. And then Washington Black is just, um, for me it's a much more uh, straightforward, purely 19th century uh, sort of voice. Um, and that was in a sense uh, quite a bit easier, mm -hmm. just because I've read so much 19th century literature, uh, but it was also fun to be able to write in that, that style. Well, I, I noticed something. Um, your other novel, The Second Life of Samuel Tyne, um, mm -hmm. also featured a male protagonist, as does Washington Black and Half-Blood Blues. Uh, what draws you to the male voice? So I, I don't think I consciously set out to write, you know, books, you know, purely with male protagonists, like all three of them. Uh, it just happened to be those were the footnotes I came across uh, in the stories, and it didn't make sense to, sense to change genders. Um, but also I think writing, writing from the male perspective has, a, it's like given me another uh, sort of layer or filter between, uh, between my life and, and the characters' lives. I'm somebody who doesn't write it all out of my own day-to-day -day experience. That's and, very and interesting. Not, why is that? I don't know. I'm <laughs> just... I don't know. I don't know why that is. Do you think that would be too close? That would be too um, revealing too much about yourself as an individual? It could be, or it could be that I find my own life very boring, and it's like, why, why would I, why would I write about that? I don't know. Um, could be, yeah. It could be that I'm, I'm a private person, and I'm sort of. That, that maybe has not been the fiction that's always interested me to read. Um, you know, I sort of. I sort of like to read something that's um, removed from myself, mm -hmm. so maybe that's why. Uh, given the big difference, uh, diff differences in time and place you've gone in your book so far, uh, what would writing outside of your comfort zone look like now? I think um, if I were to write a book that was set like, you know, 2019, <laughs> and, you know, and set in, say, Victoria, this would be writing outside of my comfort zone. I think and that I would be you, because you live in Victoria. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would find that really challenging, much more challenging than, um, you know, than, than sort of taking on another world, uh, even though doing that involves so much research and having to construct things. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe I would struggle to find uh, the big story in it. Uh, but perhaps I should, I should do that. I should challenge myself. <laughs> well, Essie, it's been a real pleasure uh, speaking with you. Um, would you have any sights on maybe turning these books into movies? Because each one reads like it could be on the big screen. Yeah, well, Half Blood Blues uh, has been optioned, so that's... Congratulations. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and then, yeah, so we'll see. 
um, yeah. nothing so far with Washington. That's but, a big but, deal, though. You're like, yeah, yeah. it's an option. <laughs> That's a big deal, isn't it? Because I know Half Blood Blues. You, it was. Uh, it took a while to get a publisher for that book. Yeah, it so was now a for long it to be, process. That must mean something. It does. Mm -hmm. uh, it had been optioned before and and not made. I think things, you know, move differently in in the film industry. Uh, so, but yeah, I'm happy. If you were it. to um, say something to 12 year old Essie, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, I don't know, I, I guess. Because coming to this place that you are in now, it did take a lot of work. It did take a lot of work. I, I guess I would say uh, that question kind of involves like, how would you do things differently a little bit? And, I guess maybe I would say just hold on, like hang in there. It's uh, it, those tough years are are, are going to be worth it. Maybe I'd say that. Essie, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. No, and considering you. you're you have a bit of a cold, so we appreciate you making the time for us. Oh, thank and you. Congratulations for on all the accolades. So oh, deserving. Thank you. thank you so much. The agenda in the summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.